Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Patreon supporter Brenna Morgan. If you'd like to learn how you can support the podcast through a monthly donation, log on to schooloflast.com forward slash Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, or patreon.com forward slash school of laughs. Thanks, Brenna. We're also today brought to you by the Clean Comedy Conference. Are you a comedian who's looking to get more paid bookings via corporate gigs, cruise ships, churches, colleges, or clubs? Are you wanting to perform or write for late night TV? Then the Clean Comedy Conference is the conference for you. The conference will be taking place in San Diego, California, October 13th through the 15th. Early bird registration ends on August 15th, so sign up today at cleancomedyconference.com. As a special offer to School of Laughs listeners, use promo code School of Laughs to save $10. Again, go to cleancomedyconference.com today. Welcome to the School of Laughs podcast, brought to you by schooloflaughs.com. Whether you're an aspiring comedian, a part-time pro, or a speaker who wants to become funnier, this is the podcast for you. We'll break down tools, tips, and techniques to help you get bigger, better, and more bookable. And now, here's the show. This is the podcast. My name is Rick Roberts, and thanks again to our sponsors, the Clean Comedy Conference, and Brenna Morgan, who's supporting us through Patreon. Patreon is a way that you can support the podcast through a monthly donation. So if that's something that speaks to you and you're finding some value in this podcast, please check that out at patreon.com forward slash school of last. We've got a great episode today. The author of Don't Wear Shorts on Stage, Rob Durham, joins us today to talk about his comedy journey from very beginning back in the early days in Columbus, Ohio, when I I first worked with him and all the way through the St. Louis days where he is currently and his transition out of comedy full time into teaching with comedy being his side hustle. So we're going to go through a lot of cool information with Rob. He wrote a book on basically how to prepare for your first open mic, what comics need to know when they first take the stage. And it's very helpful. I've read through it. And at the end, I'll tell you how you can find it online, all the normal places, Amazon, those kinds of things. But a great fun interview with a friend of mine and a comedian slash teacher, which we both have in common, Rob Durham. Let's get right into it. Well, I'm here with Rob Durham. Rob, how's it going, bud? Good. Doing great. Happy summer. Yeah, man. You doing okay? Yeah, I'm a teacher in the summer, so it's it's great. You been good? Yeah, I've been. Uh, I've had a little vacation, getting ready to go on another little vacation with. Uh, I've got an 11 year old son, and we take a man trip every summer for three or four days just ourselves. So that's coming up next week. Oh, sounds good. Cool, man. Well, I I met you way back in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, 2000, 2001, I believe. Uh, you remember the first? Who was headlining the first show we did together? Oh man, give me a clue. Uh, he's, he wasn't the, I think he's gotten better, but he was not the most popular headliner back in the day. Had a tour bus. Had a tour bus. Yes. Wasn't very popular yet. Had a tour bus. Mm-hmm. Wasn't very popular with other comics per se. Oh, it, it <laughs> probably sure. <laughs> yes, that is correct. I do remember that. Had the tour bus pulled up behind the yes. money bone. He had a bodyguard as well who also uh, told me was the White Power Ranger. So (laughs) I'm sure that guy's still doing great. Got to get credits where you can, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's funny. So that was at the new Funny Bone then in Mm -hmm. 2001. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I remember he had a pretty good-sized turnout, though, didn't he? He did. He uh, he did a 35-minute set and then a five-minute slideshow where he just name-dropped. Right. And, uh, yeah, he had a writer at the side of the st- – okay. Um, yeah, they <laughs> still Q- fond of it. <laughs> yeah, I remember he did Q&A or something, right? Yeah, and then he charged t- people $10 for a signed headshot. That's right. And I remember yeah. it was mostly like 35-year-old ladies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was his 35th or 36th birthday because his manager dragged me along to the party store to buy him balloons and stuff. Oh, man. Sorry, yeah. Gerald. I didn't know it was that bad. <laughs> oh, it was, it was It was a tough, you know, as an MC, I'm like, wow, I get to open for Polly Shore. And then by the end of the week, I was like, that wasn't worth it at all. No, man. And how long had you been doing comedy at that point? Not too long. Uh, probably a year, year and a half. Right. Yeah. And you did a lot of uh, hosting there. You went on the road a little while. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, yeah, I got spoiled there because, you know, Tuesday nights would sell out uh, when the economy was still great. And, um, you know, they papered the room a lot. But, yeah, Columbus was good to me starting out. And then uh, yeah, I got into the road more 2003 and four and quit my day job. And uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then poverty came. Then the reality of the industry came was the economy crashed. Gas went to three fifty a gallon. Yeah, t- yeah. Tell me about some of those early road gigs. Anybody you worked with that was fun? You know. Oh boy. You know, it's, it's weird. The, the, I think the people you work with first, you remember more just because it's such a fresh experience. Uh, my first MC week, not in Columbus was with Dan Davidson and Keith Alberstadt. Oh, that's like a dream week. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, well, this is fun. These comics are great. And then, you know, a few weeks later I worked a different, you know, I think I was down in Cincinnati and the, uh, headliners didn't really want to have anything to do with me. And, but you know, those guys, those guys were letting me sleep on the couch in the condo and back in the old condo days. There aren't a lot of condos left in comedy clubs, are there? It seems like they've gone more hotel. You know, the condo yeah. used to be an investment that the club would make, so they would recoup some serious coin if they ever closed down. They'd have all that equity in the condo. <laughs> yeah. You know, when they when they owned the condo outright. I remember, like, I think it was Wichita, Kansas. They bought a house. Yeah, yeah. The Looney Bins all had those houses. Right. Those were those weren't bad. Um, Wichita no. wasn't wasn't too bad. But uh, yeah, you could do your laundry there. That was the best part about the Looney Bin gigs is you could actually <laughs> do your laundry on site. Yeah, not bad, man. That's cool. So you did the road for a little while, but then, it, like you said, the economy kind of got tight. Mm-hmm. Tell you, when, when gas hit over three bucks, I felt bad for all the road comics. I mean, I still travel and do a lot of gigs, but. You know, a majority of the time I'm flying now, so I I paid for that. You know, yeah, the increased ticket cost, and then what led you to teaching? Like, what was the transition? Uh, well, while I you know, I moved to St. Louis in '05, and you know, I was still trying to get full time as a comedian, but that even you know I was featuring at a few places, but not a lot, and. Um, you know, I met my wife and we were just dating and she's like, look, are you going to be broke and gone your whole life? And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I'd been substitute teaching during the day all those years. And, um, you know, I really, really enjoyed the classroom and it's, it kind of feels like a comedy show. You get to talk all day and you get an audience, whether they listen or not. And, um, you know, I talked to a couple other teacher friends and they're like, yeah, it's not a, it's not a bad gig. And I was like, you know, I think I could still do both. So I, you know, I, I signed up, uh, university of Missouri, St. Louis, I already, I already had an English degree from Ohio state. So I went to, uh, UMSL, Missouri, St. Louis, and I could not, they said, yeah, you can get certified to teach in a year and a half. So I got student loans, which I'm still paying off. And, uh, I did that. And, you know, the first year of teaching, I got hired was brutal. It was an inner city teaching gig. Um, it was rough. <laughs> yeah. Now what, uh, and then what level yeah. was that? What grade level? Um, mostly juniors and seniors. They, um, uh, mostly good kids, but you know, it was a charter school that didn't have its stuff together. It's closed down since then. And, you know, being a rookie anyway, it was, it was really tough. So sounds like a sitcom waiting to happen. Did, yeah, it was. <laughs> did you feel like Howard Hessman and his one of his? <laughs> or, it was brutal. You know, I started. You know, the first the first week, I was like, "Yeah, I'm going to change these kids' lives. It's going to be like Dangerous Minds." By the third day, I'm just driving home crying, like, "This is terrible. Why do they hate me?" And I was in therapy. These kids have changed my life. Yeah, they all have yeah. dangerous minds. <laughs> yeah, and then you know that that school closed, so I had another year to you know do other weird jobs and more subbing and. And then I was able to get hired as a teacher at a really nice school um, in the Rockwood district in the western part of St. Louis. And uh, that's why I started featuring more in St. Louis. And they had, you know, a couple clubs around here. So I've I got I get more work or just as much work as a teacher <laughs> than I did when I was, you know, had nothing else to do. So it, it's frustrating like that. But I think now that I have this full time job, it gives me a lot more to write about and to joke about. Yeah, have you found like a lot of a lot of material in the teaching that translates to the comedy? Yes, space? yeah, they actually let me do a teacher appreciation night this year, and I did about I think twenty five, close to twenty five minutes of just straight teaching stuff, and teachers got in free, so that's going to be the first part of my CD. Uh, the teachers were a little tight on some of the edgier stuff, <laughs> so I still have to record the second half. I'd like to have a better second half when I talked about you know my wife and other things, but. Um, well, yeah, it's, it was. Uh, it's a good stick to have. Can you give me an example of an edger thing that that they kind of tightened up on that you didn't think was that edgy? Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I 
I talk about, um, you know, my wife is always steaming vegetables and, uh, you know, she's, she steamed a pound and a half of cauliflower. It's like, you know what that smells like? You know, even our Indian neighbors like, all right, you win too much. (laughs) And just bringing up, I think that, um, any other race, they kind of feel like, Hey, we shouldn't be laughing about that or yeah, just, I can see. I mean, it's a funny joke, no doubt, but there's, there's a lot of tension over in that area. Yeah. Yeah. We have, I've definitely with the, uh, the Michael Brown thing, um, the jokes, cause I, I did a lot of jokes about teaching inner city and the, the different cultures and they've really tightened up on those in the last few years because of that. Uh, there are, and it's not just the racial stuff I've noticed audiences. I'm, and I'm not, you know, I'm certainly not super edgy or anything, but, uh, jokes that worked five years ago get a lot more moans than laughs uh, it seems. Yeah, people aren't even willing to kind of open a discussion anymore, it seems like. They've got their point of view, and if you even start talking about it, they're just shutting you out. Yeah, yeah. The whole boundary or the whole immunity we used to get, well, it's a comedy club, uh, that's disappearing. And, you know, that's I'm not saying that's wrong or right. You know, it just makes it more challenging for us to write, and we need to be a little more clever in that. So. Yeah, no doubt. And so, and you teach English, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I teach, um, 10th graders and then I get to teach creative writing as well. And then this fall, they're giving me a class called sports literature. So (laughs) they're like, do with that, you know, here's, here's some books, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I was like, well, I need to watch some 30 for thirties on ESPN and, um, you know, read some fun sports books. So. Get the Maurice Claret story going. Maybe you can write, <laughs> yeah. write a sequel to that and see how that finishes out. <laughs> I could bring him in. Do you ever use um, comedy in your teaching like and, and like specifically reference like this is something the comedians do to teach your students in the creative writing class how to get a laugh? Uh, actually, we I do one of our assignments in creative writing is we do have stand-up comedy week. Um, on Monday, I... You know, I tell them, I go, let's, we'll just work on punchlines. I said, the, you know, our school's called Marquette. The Marquette Cafeteria, write the slogan. Then they just write the, the slogan. Marquette Parking Lot, and then they write that. And then the next day, I, uh, I get a bunch of newspapers and magazines from the library. And I, you know, I show them um, like a Conan O'Brien monologue and show them how you set up this, the set up punchline, set up punchline. And so some of them really pick it up. And then, um, you know, we, I kind of let them workshop the jokes with each other. And then on Friday, we actually have an open mic night in my classroom. I, I bring in a microphone. I don't plug it in. But I bring in a microphone, a stool, a mic stand. I turn the lights off except for, you know, I try and get somewhat of a spotlight. And I put up a, you know, we have a smart board behind us. So I put up a brick background back there. And I, I bring them up like an open mic. I see it. And I say, just do two jokes. Just attempt to. I'm not grading if you're funny or not. Just, just attempt to. So that's and fun. Are you surprised at some of the the results you get from that? Yeah, they always seem to uh, push the limits on that. And, you know, there's seniors within a week of graduating, so I let them get away with it. But there's, you know, you'd think the innocent ones are going to, you know, have some nice clean humor and then they <laughs> <laughs> surprise you. Yeah. But, you know, they I give them a prize at the end if they win. We have clap offs and things. So and I do, I do a little bit of, of what I can that's appropriate. But they... Um, a couple of them have showed up at shows before. That's that's always interesting. <laughs> that's cool. Do you do you like turn off? Tell them to turn off their cell phones and no recording any of this, so it doesn't get you fired. Oh my, yeah, that's been uh, a bigger and bigger issue. Is you know the yeah, it's one thing you know have your phone off so you pay attention, but now they you know I apparently I'm on Snapchat a, a lot. <laughs> oh no. Um, yeah, they'll they know what happens and. You know, they'll send answers to each other. The, these group chats are what's are what's making it really tough to teach anymore. I haven't even thought about that. So yeah, yeah they can all like, share yeah. answers during a yeah. test. Here, here's the essay to the final. You know, and I'm I'm too lazy to make a different question for each class. So. Oh man, I wonder if you can get. Uh, I know when theaters used to buy these cell phone jammers, and they would put them in a theater, and they did that for a while until they found out some of these guys were using their cell phone as nine one one responders, and they missed a call one time. Yeah, they said that's illegal to do. Mm, that'd be too bad because you could really. I know. I might still try and sneak one in. I don't know. Pretty quickly, you could find out who's using it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are cert- certain rooms in the building where it's really tough to get a signal. But my, I have a window, so that's the trade-off. Yeah, maybe. I bet if you pl- put some magnets underneath their desks, they would throw them off just <laughs> enough. Yeah. I don't know. That's 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 definitely a struggle. 
So They're always a step ahead. So uh, one thing I wanted to talk about today, and I definitely want my listeners to check out, is your book. And was that something you wrote in that first year or two when you made the transition out of full-time stand-up to teaching? Or tell me about the evolution. I started that uh, the school year I was teaching inner city. Yeah, that February. I had been um, kind of brainstorming. I was frustrated because, you know, I wasn't even getting I was. I had committed my life to stand up and I was going to open mic night in St. Louis at the funny bone. And there was a movie that came out that made it seem like everybody could do comedy. I think it was some Adam Sandler movie and Seth Rogen or somebody. And so we, we would have 50 to 60 guys show up to sign up every week. And I, you know, week after week I couldn't get on. And, um, I was like, you know, I kind of, <laughs> this is the reason I moved to St. Louis. And I kept seeing the same mistakes over and over. And I was like, how can I benefit from this? And, you know, naturally as a teacher too, you know, some people are like, why do you care how other people do? It's like, well, as a teacher, I just, I want to help. <laughs> you can't help it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you just keep seeing the same mistakes every week. So I, you know, I started writing that, um, in the fall, I guess, kind of the outlining it. And then, yeah, in the, the winter, I really worked on every weekend. I would try and write a few thousand words and I finished the first draft that summer. And then it revised, you know, I took it down the, to the pool at our apartment every day in a notebook and revised, went through it three times with a red pen and um, then got a real editor. And then it came out in December of 2011. And can you, can you give us a couple of, uh, Names of the chapters and maybe a, a, a tip from each one of those. I think I think it's really thorough. Yeah, yeah. Well, the book's called uh, "Don't Wear Shorts on Stage," um, which is the yeah. best. You know, if you if you only do that, you'll be invited. <laughs> exactly. You know, yeah. That's do. one of the uh, people ask. You know, why is that the title? That's one of the rules at the St. Louis Funny Bone. We just thought, I was like, well, you know, everything else was called you know comedy Bible and the Guide to Comedy and just generic names. So I, I thought that would be a unique thing. That comedy so got, Bible, when you get to Revelations, it's <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just the New Testament. <laughs> yeah, you spend six weeks open for Polly Shore. And it's, uh, it's the <laughs> um, yeah, the six chapters are starting out. Uh, part two is beyond open mic. Part three, I think the most important chapter of it is MC work. That's that's the longest and most thorough one. Part four is expanding your career. Part five is becoming a feature act, and then part six covers the road. Let's so, talk about the MC and then and expanding to a features. I think it's where a lot of my listeners are. Yeah. Um, well, just to get to MC, people like you know, how do I do? I I would suggest you have to kill at open mic at that club every week. And then when maybe they're noticing you, ask for a guest set during a real show. Uh, figure out which night your club does guest sets. It's not going to be first show Saturday. Um, and then, you know, once you do a, a, a good enough guest set, I think that's when you get uh, the chance of that. Um, so, yeah, it covers, covers that. The, the, all the other, you know, obviously the announcements – are important, but it covers, you know, can I talk to the comics before the show? What should I ask? What do I need to figure out? Um, and what if there's a bachelorette party? Uh, how does an MC's set vary from a regular set? Let's talk about that for a second. That, that, that's a question I recently got, actually, and was going to answer myself. I'll kind of give you, you give me your take on it, and then I'll kind of give you my take. All right. Um, well, I remember uh, it was, I think Rob Haney taught me this. It was my first week uh, working at Wiley's. I just went up and went straight into my act. <laughs> He's like, hey, 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 we're trying to sell some food and drinks here. So kind of welcome everybody, the club, you know, suggest this and that. And then, um, you know, pause, and, you know, kind of put a little timestamp there and then start your act. Go into it that way. Um you know, the toughest part about emceeing is a lot of times the the show, the, the audience isn't ready. They're still ordering. They're still talking. They don't know what's normal for a show yet. So they're like, yeah, I guess we talk through this. It's no, you really got to. And, that, you know, that's the benefit. In a club, you know, there's usually a loud music and they turn the lights out. You can tell. But in a bar show, you go up there, you're the sacrificial lamb. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why I always bring an MC on the road. You know, even if you can just pay him fifty bucks to do five or ten minutes, they it's worth they're it. that buffer. Yeah, yeah. I always thought that the best way to kind of, especially like say a bar gig where they don't even know what's going on, it, and it seems kind of hacky, but just buy a round of applause suggestions. Like buy a round of applause. How many's here for the first time? So the clapping at least gets the attention from the people who weren't paying attention. Yeah, and you kind of do that. You know, three or four of those pretty quickly, you can kind of get their focus. 
and then lead into whatever announcements they're trying to get a drink special sold or a food special, upcoming events. And when you finally, you'll notice that one little hush where you finally got everybody. Yeah. Then you slide into material. And I always try to pick a joke that was most relevant to the situation. It almost seemed like it wasn't even a joke yet. Uh, I would often write jokes about the drink specials and make maybe make up a joke about a drink special. So as I'm doing that, I'm doing my new joke about the drink special or whatever. And then now they're laughing and they've heard a set punchline and I can take them from there. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely. The, yeah. The transition into that is, um, is, is very important. I, I think, and cause you can waste your best one or two jokes if you try and do them up front before they're listening. And if those don't work, then you just get discouraged and they can see the, the, you know, the sadness in your face <laughs> yeah. after that. Yeah, and short material too, shorter jokes that yeah. think up front, you know, so yes. you yeah, one, until you got one it. two punches, yeah. Which you almost need for um, you know, any set, I think, is you gotta you gotta it took me five or it took me till I was married to to really get a good opening joke. Um, I, I thought you were going to say it took me until I was married until I realized I should just talk in short sentences because that's all I ever get to say. <laughs> well, that too, yeah. Uh, it talks about introductions too. I think, you know, if you go to a one-nighter, the bar manager wants to introduce you and he'll say your name first and he'll stumble through some stuff. Mention, you know, he'll just recite your bio in a weird way with no enthusiasm. And so, you know, the int- introduction for other comics is, is really important too. Um, yeah. What would you tell people when... You know, once you kind of get to know comics, they're like, hey, say whatever you want. But I, I find it better just to have them say, give me two credits and let's roll with it. Like instead of – I don't want to get there and ramble what I know about the comic. And I've had comics go on stage. Even recently, she she went up. She was like, this guy does a great Barney Fife. And like she kind of like burnt a surprise that I had. Yeah. And, it, and that night I wasn't even going to do that joke. So all of a sudden I was kind of thrown under the bus and it worked out okay. But it's like if I just told her, say these two things only, it yeah. would be better. I learned that the hard way. Um, I was when I was MC in Columbus. We had a guy do a guest set, and before ahead of time, I had heard he had written for Seinfeld for the show, and um, probably a over over exaggerated credential. But he he was you know somebody knew about it, and so I put that in his in his intro. And one of the other doormen said, as soon as I said that, he was like, "Oh no," because he wasn't he was new to stand up. <laughs> so I set the bar very high for him. <laughs> To do that. And yeah, people have stepped on mine too. I used to um, do a joke about looking like Jeff Goldblum and they mentioned that, or I like to tell them that I'm a teacher or when I had braces, you know, I would, I would let me tell the joke. Um, so yeah, if you're emceeing, don't, don't improvise anything, say only what they tell you to say. And if, if they don't give you anything, then yeah, tours, clubs, and colleges, you know, it's always a default yeah, generic because honestly the crowd doesn't care a lot about your credentials, but if you mess them up, then it does become a big deal. Right. I don't even care about my credentials as much as I just want them to stop talking (laughs) for one or two seconds. You know, and when you're headlining, especially that break from the feature act, the MC comes back up, everybody just went to the bathroom. Like there's a third of the crowd sometimes at a a bar gig, especially are gone. So now you can't smoke, you can't smoke inside either. So they all take smoke breaks as well. Yep, but they will still sit there and text. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, the, that, that they can do right in front, yeah. Now, when you have a bachelorette party, how would you approach it as an MC, and how would you approach it as a stand-up that's later in the show? Do you, would, you, um, would you approach it differently? As an MC, if you know the headliner, hey, does this headliner like to do crowd work? Um, you need to judge that bachelorette party going in. Are they super blitzed? Are they... Can I already tell they're going to be a problem or some of them behave? I think in the last few years, it seems like they behave a little better. I don't know if that's just St. Louis, which is very unlikely, but um, it just, I I think you got to kind of play it by ear to see. And you can even ask the headliner, Hey, do you want me to get them out of the way or can, do you want to handle them? And I, I think a lot of times now the headliners are like, yeah, go ahead and you know, if you just acknowledge them, even up front at the end of the year MC set, all they want is little attention. And then, you know, maybe one little cut on them and they'll realize, hey, maybe we should shut up. But, you know, just like any other group of drunks, um, sometimes there was a behavior issue. I, I had a girl, uh, was at Fairview Heights, I'm seeing, and uh, one of the girls passed out 
at 8.06 p.m. Oh, on no. the table. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so there's good and bad there. Yeah. But, um, you know, if they have all of those props that they bring, you know, maybe the club's usually pretty good about removing that. And clubs are a lot more helpful, I think, with them. Yeah, you know, there were some clubs back in the day, you know, the other club in Dayton, where they really – that was their selling point. They wanted every bachelorette party in town to come there. It, it just got to be brutal. Um, and I'm with you. You know, I think the MC check with the headliner, and if they don't want to deal with it, address it a little bit early on, and then say, "Hey, listen, that that was your little time right now. The rest of the show, you're with the rest of the audience. And sometimes you got to make it really clear. You make yeah. make him off as a jerk, but I tell you, it's a lot better to shut it down early than to let it swell up. When the comic, there's every comic after. A year, they feel they're ready to feature, but it's not the case, right? So, what makes what makes it more clear in your mind that I'm ready to feature and get out of this MC spot? Uh, it's kind of like when you're in a relationship, and you're like, "Oh, I messed that last one up. I didn't know what I was doing." Then you go to the next one, you're like, "All right, I know what I'm doing. I'm ready for this. This is good." And then you break it. You're like, "No, that was stupid. What am I doing?" <laughs> it's been tough, hasn't it, Rob? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's kind of the way you should look at your your material if you don't feel like your material a year ago was oof, or what you were doing every couple of years at least f- through the first six or seven i would say at least then you're not progressing um yeah i think that's one of the biggest misconceptions is that with i don't want to say our our scene is you know comedy is watered down but there's a lot more venues where people can rise through the ranks quicker and they're like, yeah, I have 30 minutes. Yes, you have 30 minutes of jokes, but you have 30 minutes of MC level jokes, meaning on a scale of one to 10, maybe there are four or five. And four or five for 30 minutes is. Ugh. Right. So not only does your, your set need to be longer, but those jokes need to be twice as funny. And the, the laughs per minute really has to go up. I mean, you need to kill. You know, Nick Griffin explained this to me really well, and he made me kind of analyze my entire set. It was 2005. I quit my day job, and I was like, oh, my, yeah, I have a lot to work on still. Yeah, Nick's a great wordsmith, and every time I've seen him on Letterman and, and the late shows, he just destroys it, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah I, I reference him a few times in my book. He's he's very uh, real about about comedy. He's you know, he's kind of the, the person I mentioned at the end of it that, that's – not to be a downer, but he, you know, he, he's real about what, what, how terrible this industry can be. So it can definitely be rough. I, I like what you said there about the 30 minutes because, you know, and again, I think it was Eddie Brill that said like your act right now is just like a vehicle. And when you're an MC, you're driving a beat up Honda CRV or something that's, that's getting you there, but you can't pull that Honda CRV into the feature spot at an improv. You need to be in a better vehicle that's more sound and flashier and got all the bells and whistles. And when you're headlining, you got to pull up in a Jaguar. And even though you can talk for 60 minutes, maybe one year into it, it's not, you know, the vehicle isn't there yet. Yeah. And you could have the material, you know, you could have that 30 minutes of material, but you have to undergo all those terrible gigs that build the experience like, okay, I've seen this before, or, hey, I can spot what, you know, what's going to be wrong with this room before I even go up there. And you you just, you have to build those instincts up. And it's just impossible. It takes years and years. And I, you know, comics are frustrated. They're like, this is what I want to do with my life. It's like, all right, get a job while you're learning. And they don't want to do that. Yeah. The, you can tell a comic that's weathered at all. Like it's, I was reckon it to like Clint Eastwood's face. Like if you look at his face when he first started acting, <laughs> it was okay. <laughs> yeah. But look at how much he has in his face without even saying something. He could just move one eyebrow and it changes the entire mm-hmm. storyline of the movie. That's, that's how, how aged and weathered and, and matured he is as an actor and comics that's something you can't put on the on the fast track you know you've got to go out there and do those gigs or sometimes they get asked like where are the best open mics in town i'm like the next one because they you need them all even the worst ones with their six comics standing in a corner and you know until you've met there a couple hundred times just keep going yeah you don't know how good you can't measure how great a comic is in a good room it's in the really bad room that you know i used to um Oh, shoot. I can't remember his name. But my one of my worst gigs ever was Muncie, Indiana, and I was featuring, and I just, one table liked me, and they were very, you know, it was very rednecky. 
But then the headliner went up there and adjusted and just like that, he killed. And I was like, how was he able to, you know, right. It's just, I don't know. There's those eye opening moments. It's almost like when, when I had a, got my guitar like la- last year of high school and I went to college and I thought I knew a couple things on the guitar and somebody yeah. picked up my guitar and played like Eruption from Van Halen and then handed it back to me. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know those notes were on this guitar. <laughs> yeah. And when you see I, a great headliner, it's like that too. Like there, there's nights where you, you know, where you, where you thought you killed even. And then all of a sudden the next guy goes up and it's like, oh, there were a lot more laughs in this room that I didn't get. Yeah, yeah. What What is nice is if you don't do well, then the headliner struggles as well. It's like, okay, it wasn't me. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't me. Maybe I dug a deeper hole for him than he was used to. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, and a lot of that too is you see the little tricks that headliners do. You know, mention something local. Uh, mention something in the room. Which, you know, it doesn't always work, but, um, you know, the one time, not to name drop, but I got, to, I had the honor of working with Maria Bamford at Missouri State a few years ago, quite a few years ago, I think 08 maybe. And, uh, it was in their theater and I did all right, but it, you know, and then she got out on stage and she's like, can we turn the house lights off, please? I was like, oh my, I didn't realize the whole theater was lit. No one, you know, that never works oh, when they can God. see themselves and that. And, Clicked it off, you know. Of course, she killed for an hour, got a standing ovation, and I was like, you know, I, th- I, I guess I'm, I'm not a college kid anymore, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's true too. You know, as you as you grow in and out of your material, stuff resonates better mm-hmm. at certain points in your life, and you got it's almost like a snake shedding its skin. There's a fifth, fifth analogy in the past three minutes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you got to kind of now it's this. If I'm going to survive, it looks like this, and I have to get rid of some of that stuff that was holding me back. Yeah. What's interesting is I. Um, you know, I have all these high school teacher jokes. I work, I do a deja vu out of Columbia, which is on University of Missouri. Which is and, a comedy club for those people who are yes, outside yes, of the area. No, but, um, <laughs> you know, it used to be when I started there in 07, I was like, yeah, college kids, young stuff. And then now I'm like the old man making fun of people their age. And I was like, I need to adjust a few things there. But they, you kind of, you definitely, you can't hide your age with your material on stage. So, no, it's, it's, you got you got to be authentic, and it's pretty hard to pull that old material off when you're a much older guy. Just, yeah, yeah, I've seen silly. comic. Yeah, I've seen headliners there. Like, remember when the playground was all jagged nails, and these kids are like, "No, we're 21." You know, <laughs> right. So it's true. It's always been like the soft ground rubber mulch. <laughs> yeah, and the uh, the wax on the on the chain so they don't burn your hands. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Well, where can people find uh, your book? Don't wear shorts on stage. It's a book that. You know, I thought about writing a book like this. I'm like, well, well, Rob kind of summed it all up here, so I'd like to recommend it to my listeners. Oh, thank you. Um, it's on Amazon if you want a paperback. You can go to robdurhamcomedy.com if you would like a signed copy. You can go through my PayPal account. Shipping is free. Um, can't beat that. It's a, few more, it's a few more bucks. That's how it all equals out. I see. <laughs> <laughs> and then if, you're, uh, if you like eBooks, it's on iTunes, Kindle, Nook, Kobo, and all those formats. So I I don't have an audio version. People have asked for that. I'm like, no, I'm not. No, it's a reference. It's kind of a, you know, nobody. <laughs> you wanna, hey, I'll do an audio version for you. I'll read it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. You, can, you can strum in the background and yeah, I'll play a little set it to music a little bit. Well, that, that's great stuff, Rob. Thank you very much for letting us know about your website. The book is called Don't Wear Shorts on Stage. I highly recommend it. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Rob Durham, the author of Don't Wear Shorts on Stage. I'll link in the show notes to everywhere you can pick that book up so you can order it today and read through the rest of it. As you can tell, Rob's got a lot of great information. It was fun catching up with Rob. I saw him one of his first times on stage, I guess it was, back there in the old Columbus, Ohio days. If you're in the Nashville area and you would like to take the writing class, it is coming up very soon, Mondays, August 1, 8, and 15 from 6 to 8 p.m., That's in Nashville at SIR Studio Instrument and Rental Facility, uh, right down the street from Zaney's. If you're in the Nashville area and you're thinking about taking the class, maybe it's time. I'm thinking about maybe condensing the classes to just twice a year, like a weekend boot camp. So this would be a great chance to get to it this year. For sure, I'll know I'll be teaching this writing class in August. I'm not sure after that because the schedule is getting pretty heavy. So find out more about that at schooloflast.com. You can check out the live comedy class link on there. And if you're not in the area and you want to take the online writing class, it's over 46 videos, almost four hours in length 
total. Over 115 have taken that course online now, and the feedback's been great. They get a lot out of it. They can do it on their own time, and that's definitely worth your time to check out, especially if you're finding yourself kind of stuck with what you've got with your writing style right now, and you think your jokes need to be a little funnier. There's a reason that they're not as funny as they can be, and we cover 14 to 15 techniques in this online class to punch your stuff up. Lots of assignments in there. You should generate 8 to 10 minutes of material if you just do the homework in that online class. Again, all the classes you can find out about schoollaughs.com. And lastly, this episode is also brought to you by the Clean Comedy Conference, which takes place this year, October 13th through 15th in San Diego, California. There's an adage in stand-up comedy that clean is green, and that means two things. It means, one, that clean plays everywhere, and two, it can lead to some cash. At this conference, you're going to learn about this from professional comedians and bookers such as Eddie Brill, Jimmy Brogan, Charlene May, Amy Piddle, Tony Calabrese, and Scott Wood. And they're going to address how to navigate the challenges of making money as a clean comedian. In addition to working at clean comedy venues, most of these speakers and panelists have written for television and booked clubs, colleges, churches, cruise ships, and late-night TV such as Letterman. So listen up. You want to check this conference out. The theme for this year is Clean Isn't a Dirty Word. Come out and find out for yourself why. Early bird registration ends August 15th, so sign up today at cleancomedyconference.com. And as a thank you to School of Last listeners, use promo code School of Last for a special $10 discount. Again, go to cleancomedyconference.com for more information today. Thanks for being with us. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to the School of Laughs podcast. If you'd like to hear more School of Laughs podcasts, you can find them on iTunes and Stitcher.com. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. For information on upcoming live and online classes, visit schooloflaughs.com. Until next time, stay tuned, stay focused, and stay money.